Um, and then so uh, our theme for this morning is deeper into prayer. And then our second conference, which will take place in the afternoon, contemplative stretching out into the apostolic life. And then the third conference, contemplative active in praise. And we'll see how praise of the Lord helps us to live out this call to be um, active contemplatives, uh, contem contemplatives in the world. So, you know, this is key to our Dominican vocation, to contemplate and to hand on what is contemplated. And so that's what we're going to open up uh, into with God's help uh, today. And so, you know, the first stage in this or the first step is to become contemplative, to go deeper in prayer, hence the theme for our first talk. And say, Catherine's going to help us here. So uh, let's start with prayer. We'll turn first to our Blessed Mother. She who pondered all the mysteries of her son and her heart, keeping them there. We ask her to draw us into her heart, pierced open by those seven swords of sorrow, that we might have a place in her heart. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And at the hour of our death, amen. Lord, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit into the depths of our heart. We can't do anything salvific, worthy of you, uh, without your help. So we ask you to uh, anoint this day, the help of your Spirit, to draw us deeper into prayer and to draw us uh, to share that life of prayer with others, your very own life, as it flows into our hearts and out into the world. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Holy Father, St. Dominic. Pray for us. Holy Father, St. Francis. Pray for us. St. Catherine of Siena. St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Vincent Fair. St. Martin de Porras. St. Agnes of Montepulciano. Blessed Henry Suso. St. Rose of Lima. St. Albert the Great. Uh, Pierre Giorgio Frassati, St. John Paul II, St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. I decided to, to sit rather than, than stand, and I, I'll just start with a line from St. Augustine. It is on... Uh, De Disciplina Christiana. He says, whoever teaches has set his chair in heaven. <laughs> I'm not like saying that to like um, scare you or place myself uh, on like this chair in heaven, but just to point out that all of us Dominicans, as we share in this mission of preaching sacred doctrine, this is the sublimity of what we do. I said, not just me sitting on this chair, but whenever we teach, proclaim the gospel, open up uh, the sacred doctrine through our sacred study, uh, we set our chair in heaven. Whoever teaches has set his chair in heaven. And we're letting the light of God flow into our hearts and from our minds and hearts out to others. And that is our high call, right? We're not just like sharing information not even just sharing like information about the faith, <laughs> about the life of Jesus. Uh, we have a chair set in heaven, set in heaven, and we're letting light from above, supernatural light, uh, get into our world. And we as Dominicans are especially to be especially apt instruments, especially apt channels to let that light from heaven enter into our world. And since it is heavenly light, we're going to have to be rooted in prayer for this to happen, for this to be fruitful, because it is so beyond us. So just to kind of set before ourselves <laughs> the sublimity of what we're about as Dominicans, and just to emphasize the need we have for God's help, right? Or this task is not going to happen. Um, and so we do need to be men and women of prayer uh, for this light from heaven to enter into our souls and into the souls of others. 
right? I mean, this is a, this stands in testimony against myself as well. Um, you know, when we share the gospel with your, our family members, our loved ones, and they're not receiving it, um, it could be because we're not doing enough prayer and penance for them. You know, without that at the heart of uh, our preaching, um, we'll see some results, but not the floodgates of heaven opening uh, that we want. And so I say that in testimony against myself as well, <laughs> this call to greater penance uh, and, and prayer for the sake of souls. Right? And that's where our forefathers and foremothers were, right? St. Dominic, oh, what happened to poor sinners? St. Catherine of Siena, St. Rose of Lima, St. Martin de Porres, whoa. Um, all these people uh, stand in testimony against us at the same time as being our family members and cheering us on and winning us graces uh, to share in that sublime mission that they had uh, as Dominicans. Um, as you know, St. Dominic founded the Dominican nuns before he founded the Holy Preaching among the friars, particularly for this reason. So our, our first step uh, today, we're going to talk about going deeper into prayer. And... Um, you know, obviously we could spend the whole day on this, um, but just to kind of get ourselves into this theme, I think, you know, the classic way of talking about prayer and different ways of prayer is kind of dividing it into three uh, kind of types of prayer and the catechism of the Catholic church. Thank you, John, for, for this, um, follows this and it's kind of the threefold distinction between vocal prayer, meditation, and mental prayer. And so the idea is that, you know, all these three types of prayer, these three categories of prayer, it's not like a step-by-step -step where, okay, you get past one and then you like, you're done with that. Uh, but no, these are three aspects of prayer that are always at work, but that we grow deeper into. And that part of going deeper is the 10 is going from vocal prayer to meditation, to mental prayer. And mental prayer includes contemplative prayer. It includes, you know, a whole scope of a more spontaneous free prayer, a more uh, being attuned to God's work in the soul, receiving light and love from above, corresponding to the graces we receive in prayer. Um, and so all of that is included in mental prayer. And um, as I'm sure you, you remember, you know, St. Catherine of Siena, he talks a lot about mental prayer in this way, as we'll see here in a few moments. You know, there are other kind of ways of category, categorizing prayer. This basic vocal prayer, med meditation, and mental prayer is kind of the basic way of the, the church's tradition looking at this. But, you know, like especially John the Cross and Teresa of Avila, if you want more of like the distinctions among mental prayer, uh, then uh, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila kind of help in fill in some of those details, right? Prayer of quiet, the fourth mansion, uh, prayer of union, fifth mansion, spiritual patrol, those sixth mansion, seventh mansion, spiritual marriage. And so you can get more detailed in that whole scope of mental prayer. Uh, but we're going to stick with kind of the basic categorization, which, you know, can take you into the depths of God. <laughs> Obviously, vocal prayer, meditation, and uh, mental prayer. And, you know, the catechism explicitly identifies mental prayer as contemplative prayer. I appreciate that. Okay. It just, I mean, I preached a lot on this in St. Thomas Aquinas, but it just occurred to me today that, so this is uh, Summa Theologiae, question 83. So this is the second part of the second part. And this is question 83, which is on prayer. Primarily, St. Thomas has in mind vocal prayer here. Um, and then uh, Article 13 of question 83, he asks the question whether attention is necessary for prayer. Um, and so he makes some distinctions there. But within the body of his response here, he says there's a threefold attention that happens in prayer. That's at work in prayer. And he's thinking about vocal prayer. He says you can be attentive to the words of the prayer. 
You can be attentive to the meaning of the words or the sense of the words, number two. And number three, you can be attentive to God. God. Um, so, um, so that's so the first level of attention or type of attention is attention to the words of the prayer, attentio ad verbum, attention to the words. The second type of attention is attentio ad sensum, attention to the sense of the words or the meaning of the words. And the third uh, mode of attention is attentio ad deo, attention to God. And uh, St. Thomas says that last kind of attention is most necessary. And even idiots are capable of it. So we're, we're, that, that's a word of hope for us. <laughs> even idiots are capable of it. And, you know, of course, he means idiots here in a more technical sense. People who don't have use of their faculties are even capable of this attentio ad deo. Right? And as we come to the end of life, and maybe we enter into a, a coma, uh, you know, can that person in that state pray? Yes, even with, even idiots are capable of it. There can be that deeper movement of the spirit of the spirits uh, towards God. And we want some training uh, to kind of find that place of prayer <laughs> while we're uh, transitioning from this life to the next life. And so it's, it can be sometimes helpful to pray that way, to find kind of a, a deeper space of prayer. Um, yeah, how am I going to pray if I'm in a coma, in a coma someday? Find that place of the Spirit now. You know, not to like always pray uh, in that way, but it can be a helpful exercise in like teaching you to go deeper. Because yeah, of course our faculties are involved in prayer, intellect, will, um, and memory, you know, like according to Catherine of Siena. Uh, but there's also like a deeper place. What the Rhineland mystics, including Blessed Henry Suso, like to call the ground of the soul. And the ground of the soul, they say, is what St. Thomas calls the essence of the soul. And it's from the, the essence of the soul is where grace adheres, St. Thomas says. Grace adheres in the essence of the soul. And from the essence of the soul flow forth the faculties, intellect and will. So grace dwells in the soul in a more profound deeper place than our faculties, okay? And the Rhineland mystics like Blessed Henry Suso and John Powler, my favorite, uh, refer to that as the ground of the soul. So as we pray, it's worth thinking, yeah, let's dip down deeper into the ground of the soul, the grunt of the soul in German, uh, where, that in where, that, where that place is where intellect and will flow forth. Where that place is where loving and knowledge are, are kind of blended together. Uh, that general loving knowledge of God. Uh, that attentive loving gaze upon God. Uh, let's, you know, at times pray there in that deeper place of prayer. Um, in that ground of the soul. Uh, and that helps bring us deeper as well. So what occurred to me today thinking about this attention to the words of the prayer attention to the sense of the words, attention to God, what occurred to me is you can kind of make those correspond to these three, this threefold types of prayer that we just laid out, right? Vocal prayer kind of lines up with attention to the words. Meditation kind of lines up with the sense of the words, the meaning of the words, right? And then mental prayer or contemplative prayer lines up pretty well with this attentio adeo, attention to God. And in fact, you know, St. Thomas's teaching here is very much in line with what Teresa of Avila says about mental prayer. She says, you know, a prayer where you're not attentive of the one whom we're approaching, or you're not a, a aware of who you are, the poor sinner, so in need of God, or not aware of like what you're asking. She says, you know, a prayer where you're not aware of God, uh, she doesn't consider prayer however much the lips are moving. And so in our vocal prayer, in our meditation, uh, to, we have to be aware of God <laughs> uh, for it to be real prayer. And St. Thomas is getting at the same thing. So there are ways, right, in which our vocal prayer, all these three levels of attention are happening at the same time. And so just a little more description on, of this. 
you know, attention to the word. So you're praying Psalm 23 and you're focusing on the words as they come. Attentio ad verbum. Uh, the second mode of awareness, attention, attentio ad sensum, attention to the meaning of the words. You know, sometimes as we pray Psalm 23, just our minds like can't grab onto the words and we're like distracted. Sometimes in that case, it's good then to shift your attention more to the sense of the words, the meaning of Psalm 23. You've prayed Psalm 23 thousands of times in your life and you've related to Christ, you've related to the Lord as your good shepherd. Sometimes you don't have to be like so caught up in every single word. You can focus more on the meaning of the words. The Lord as your good shepherd and leaning on his heart, letting him carry you as a good shepherd carries the lamb close to his heart. Right? You can allow yourself to be drawn more into the meaning of Psalm 23 and not like hit every word with a particular like focus. And sometimes we just can't do that. And sometimes the fact that we just can't do that is in fact God's invitation to draw you deeper into prayer. Right? So that, that's often how he works. Ways we're used to praying that all of a sudden become dry, that don't bear the same fruit as they used to, are often an invitation to find a deeper place of prayer. You know, John of the Cross opens up this just with marvelous precision and helpfulness. But he's building on John Tyler, by the way, the Dominican. Um, you know, just by the, so John Tyler was translated into Spanish and into Latin when John of the Cross would have been like seven or eight. Within two years, uh, John Tyler is translated into Spanish, I think, in 1548, and then into Latin, 1550. So when John of the Cross what would be in seminary, these things would be accessible to him. And the more that I'm reading John Tyler, the more I'm seeing where John the Cross is pulling from John Tyler. You know, John the Cross, he doesn't like refer to his authorities by name. He rarely does that. Um, and to see that, um, anyways, I could open that up more, but, um, and so this idea that dry, so about 200 pages of John Tyler's 750 page corpus, about 200 of those pages are about the dark night the dark night of the senses, the dark night of the spirit. And so John of the Cross is learning a lot from John Tyler and, uh, and transmitting that. Um, so when we talk about this, and I make a reference to John of the Cross, it's just that he's given a particular helpful articulation to that, uh, but we haven't stepped out the bounds of the Dominican world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And in fact, to be Dominican, I think we want to be open, right, to, to the whole church and like the fruits of, you know, the spiritual life and uh, the insights of all the great spiritual masters. You know, I take as a guide and how we do this, um, Gary Lagrange, right? And think about his three ways of the interior life. He's not just drawing from Din Dominican writers. He's drawing from everyone. Uh, and that just, it makes so much sense. Um, say that again. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah, we want we want the truth wherever it comes from and wherever we find insights and to, to bring it together. But yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um so I mean as you may know, I'm working through a monthly um series on John Tyler, Dominican House of Prayer. So, you know, you can read along twenty five pages a month and we'll go deeper into John Tyler. If you want more details about John Tyler's relationship to John of the Cross, you can find it in the first video there. Um, so oftentimes, okay, so you're doing vocal prayer and your mind is just scattered. Um, so that can be an invitation to like focus more on the meaning of the words. And that can be an invitation to go deeper into prayer. Uh, or it can just be like just the, the rhythms and the, the cycles of our life uh, and our days. Like I know when we as a Dominican community do the day profundus, before our main meal. I just know from experience, I cannot like focus on the words of Psalm 130. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. I don't think because the food is sitting there and I'm already like thinking about the food. <laughs> I know it's because I'm rushing to get to the, the, the line or, you know, to the, the prayer before meal or whatever, but I just know from experience, it's not going to happen. And so what I have found to do is to focus on the meaning of what we're doing. 
And so as we go through the friars and who we're praying for for that day, our deceased friars, I just, you know, focus on the fact that the meaning of the words and what we're doing, that there are real souls on the other end of our prayers who are being purified. There are real persons with their, their whole life story, uh, with kind of the importance of their hungering and thirsting for righteousness, their desire to, to be purified and come into the, the, the beatific vision of God. I focus more on the meaning of what we're doing. And I find that that's something my mind can grab onto in those, you know, couple minutes uh, as we're doing the De Profundis and so forth. So it's helpful to be aware of these three modes of attention so that you can, like, focus on whichever is most helpful. And maybe when things are going best, you don't have to, like, think through that. You just do kind of what you're led to. You focus more on God and on what you're praying. Uh, but there are times where it's not quite working for whatever reason. And then it's just helpful to know that there are these different three modes of attention. And we can shift our focus to one of the three. And it doesn't mean we're not praying, but in fact, it could mean that our, our prayer is, is all the more profound. And as St. Th Thomas notes here, the most important attention here is the attentio ad deum, attention to God. He says, moreover, this attention whereby the mind is fixed on God is sometimes so strong that the mind forgets all other things, as Hugh of St. Victor states. So, you know, so, you know, as a Carthusian monk, we would have these night offices that would go like two, two and a half hours. And I found there in prayer that when it was hard to, hard to focus on the words, when focusing on the meaning, the sense of the words kind of bore their fruit, that to kind of spend most of my time or my attention focusing on God was the best way to make those, that time of prayer most fruitful. And especially you know, our Lord Jesus' presence in the, the Blessed Sacrament, in the tabernacle. So, you know, as I'm like sitting in choir and the tabernacle's here, probably as I'm chanting the Psalms and doing things, I'm probably kind of like leaning this way. Because <laughs> I'm kind of aware of the, the Lord Jesus being over here. Um, and then, so yeah, making that your attention um, as you're praying the vocal prayer and uh, focusing on the meaning of the words, like, yeah, that's where it's all supposed to lead to anyway, right? Um, and we can see how the Lord draws us there, uh, that that's how we are drawn into deeper prayer, where we enter into a silence, even if it's just a silence of soul as we're praying the words. As we enter into a silence, that's not like the Buddhist silence of the void, but it's the silence that is all word, right? Because you were focusing on the words. You were focusing on the meaning of the words, the Lord as your good shepherd. And you're there in kind of that sweet spot of leaning on the Lord's heart as your good shepherd. So then that silence that you enter into is a silence of fullness, it's a silence that's all word. It's a silence that's not lack of meaning, but an overabundance of meaning. It is a silence that's a, 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 a plenitude, a silence of plenitude, not of lack. And these deepest modes of prayer, right, it only comes from the Lord. Uh, he's the one who has to stir up. Um, these deeper sentiments in our soul. He's the one who has to infuse light uh, from above. He's the one who has to infuse fire from above. And then as we're drawn more deeply into prayer, we're more receptive. You know, St. John of the Cross has those classic three signs that God is doing precisely that, infusing light and love into your soul in a special way. He has those three classic signs, which in fact our first in John Power. <laughs> so that's one of the clear places you can see John the Cross drawing from John Power. And by the way, John Power is 1300 to like 1360. John the Cross, 1542 to 1591. Um, but you see him drawing from, from John Power there. And the three signs, just to help you here, um, is that one, like the vocal prayer and meditation it's not bearing the fruit like it used to. 
And there was a dryness here that, that wasn't there before. I remember <laughs> Father Donald Calloway, probably many of you know him, the missionary, or the Marian of the Immaculate Conception, and his conversion story. Um, that, you know, after his conversion story, I just love, he would talk about, he would just do the Stations of the Cross, like, over and over again. And I love to hear, like, he would do the Stations of the Cross and then, like, just lay on the pew and, like, take a nap. <laughs> and then, like, get up again, do the Stations of the Cross again. Um, you know, I, I mean, he's taking a nap because he's, you know, he's still kind of getting over his drug addictions and kind of all these other things. <laughs> and so well, there's a lot going on there. Um, but, you know, we too, right, we, we go through this phase where, like, it's the stations of the cross and, like, we're, we're weeping. It's filling us with great devotion. And, like, over the years, as we keep doing the stations of the cross, uh, sometimes that can kind of dry up. And then we can get worried, we can get concerned, like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something wrong. Oh my gosh, like, the Lord's no longer with me. Oh my gosh, you know, pr my prayer is no longer pleasing, it's no longer good anymore. Uh, you know, oh my gosh, well, what's happening? And then so we can, like, on, on the one hand, we could try to, like, reproduce, like, those tears. We can try to, like, force it. Like, I'm really going to, like, make myself, like, emotionally involved in this, and I'm going to force it. And then, okay, it can kind of work maybe a little bit, but it's eventually a dead end, right? Um, and so, you know, so St. John of the Cross, so that's the first sign of the three, that the Lord is drawing you into to deeper infused contemplation. This is the beginning of the dark night of the senses. So there's the dark night of the senses and the dark night of the spirit, which is, which is more pr profound. Dark night of the senses is a transition from the purgative to the illuminative way. Dark night of the spirit is the transition between the illuminative way and the unitive way. And that's St. Thomas's explicit teaching. Um, and St. John of the Cross says that most who apply themselves to prayer do enter into the dark night of the senses. And that's proven by the fact that most who dedicate themselves to prayer, do experience aridity in prayer. And it's that aridity in prayer that, you know, is the, the, the dark night of the census. And the flip side of the, the coin here is that um, the dark night of the census is infused contemplation. It is God pouring light into your soul and love from above. And you have to be more receptive. There needs to be a greater stillness of soul. Um, you know, relating to God on the level of the affections and emotions, we need to do that. But obviously, that can only take us so deep. Our affections and our emotions are made for the created world. They're made for finite things. Um, they're made for inter interactions like with the true, the good, the beautiful on the sensible level. And we need to start within that place. But obviously, God is beyond created things. He's beyond finite things. And so a deeper contact with the Lord is not on the emotional, emotional, sensible level. It's more on spirit to spirit with the Lord. Spirit to spirit contact with the Lord. And so, uh, so it's much more delicate, much more subtle. So that means, at first, what we experience most is dryness, aridity. And God sadly pouring more pure light into your soul, more pure love into your soul. It's more delicate, um, less detectable by the senses, so you, you don't notice it at first. Your soul has to be like reordered, reconfigured, reintegrated to be more sensitive to touches of the spirit, delicate touches of the spirit. And to do that then, you need to enter into a greater silence and stillness in your soul. Okay. Uh, okay, yep. So the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. He said, Art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, the mother of God. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the, uh, behold the handmaid of the Lord. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And I will be to hell. And the word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, the Holy Mother of God. Let us pray, for forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So the, the first sign uh, that the Lord is, in fact, pouring forth um, new light and love, deeper prayer, infused contemplation into our souls. The first sign is that uh, our, our older ways of praying, our more emotional, sensible ways of praying, meditation, it, it's, it's leaving us dry um, and arid. And it, it's, hard, it's hard to do. It, it's not working as well like at the, at the beginning. Uh, you know, so Father uh, Donald Haggerty, as he explains, you know, those, those early months or years of, you know, Stations of the Cross, and like he's just, it's, it's, he's filled with vigor. And um, then he, as he puts it, you know, then at some point, uh, God takes away the lollipop. <laughs> God takes away the lollipop of a sensible consolation and delight, right? Um, and this is precisely why he takes away the lo lollipop is because on the sensible level, the emotional level, uh, that's capable of only re receiving so much of God. Is it's made for the finite world. God is infinite. To be more apt to receive more of God, a greater fullness of God, it needs to be more spirit to spirit. And that is a delicate place to find, especially at first, to, to transition your prayer so it is more of by just faith, hope, and charity distilled acts of faith, hope, and charity. So in faith, you know, emotionally you might not feel God's presence, but to make that pure act of faith. Lord, I know you are presence, present. I adore you. I love you. To make that act of faith when you don't feel like making the act of faith, or when it doesn't feel like God is present. When it seems like your prayer is crashing and burning. Uh, to make that act of hope, that more naked, pure act of hope, a more distilled act of hope. Uh, Lord, I hope in you. I trust in you. Uh, you know, my recompense is in you. Isaiah 49, it feels like I have labored in vain and in vain spent my strength. But my recompense is with the Lord. My recompense is with the Lord. And we can say that in prayer <laughs> sometimes, echoing Isaiah 49. I feel like I've labored in vain and spent my strength for nothing. But my recompense is in the Lord. Right? And when we hope in God, when we have to hope in God, when it you know, seems like the, the cards, the, the deck of cards are stacked against us, when like on an earthly perspective, it seems like we're at an end, when we're hoping against hope, right? That's actually when our hope is most pure. That's when you actually can make the most complete act of hope and that involves a great a greater handing over of yourself to the lord when you don't get to see the fruits yet you entrust the fruitfulness to the lord you have to hand yourself over more to the lord so that's the power of the theological virtues that's the power of hope and that's what abraham is praised for in romans 4 he hoped against hope and gave glory to god being fully convinced that he had power to do what he had, had, had promised so that's um, so in that place of the, of, of the desert and aridity, it's us growing in the theological virtues, our faith, hope, and love becoming more pure, right? And then at charity, it loves God for its own sake, 
Not so much loving God because we get a reward. Not so much loving God because it's consoling to do that and the sweet consolations we receive. But when those things dry up, you're brought more into this opportunity of loving God for his own sake. I'm going to stay here, Lord, in the Adoration Chapel, even though this chapel has turned into a prayer furnace. I'm going to stay in here to honor you, to give glory to you. It's about you, Lord. And that's a more pure act of charity that the Lord's drawing us into. And you're not going to have the same sensible consolation, but in fact, you're moving down uh, at a deeper level of the Spirit. It's a more pure act of love. John the Cross distinguishes between a burning love and an esteeming love. And Francis de Sales says a similar thing. A burning, ardent love. But there are times where we don't experience that burning, ardent love. Well, then we, we transition to an esteeming love, revering the Lord in that stance of love towards him. So, I mean, that's very helpful, too, when you're not feeling the burning love. Even just like human nature, you can't always <laughs> be experiencing the burning love. Um, and then so to transition into an esteeming love, a revering love. Or it's the fire that flames compared to the burning embers. Right? You have that campfire that's burned all night and it looks like it's dead. All you see is ashes. Sometimes we look into our souls and all we see is ashes. <laughs> but right under those ashes, there are those burning embers. And that's a deeper place of the, of the soul. That's a, a deeper, more profound spirit-to-spirit -spirit contact with the Lord. More pure faith, open charity. So that the Rhineland mystics, like Blessed Henry Suso and John Towler, a lot of their language about the ground of the soul is to like draw us to that place deeper than the ashes, uh, deeper than what's detectable by the senses. Uh, and so this language of uh, going down into the ground of your soul and encountering the Lord there helps us to do that. Right? It all builds on the indwelling Trinity. Through grace, for those who are in the state of grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwell in our souls as in a temple. And so the Ryman mystics prefer to use the language of sinking rather than ascent. You, know, you can describe uh, getting closer to God as an ascent. You know, that's fine. There's a, you know, a lot of truth to that. Um, and the Ryman mystics use that language as well. But they seem to prefer this language of sinking. <laughs> into God. Uh, and it gets at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by grace dwelling in the soul as in a temple. And so they should find that dwelling place of the Lord and to adore him, love him, give him everything, praise him, thank him there. The Ryman mystics also to help us in this going deeper use the language of the desert of the soul. Right? The soul is a desert. It's expansive like that. There's in the depths of the soul, you, you go beyond images. You go beyond words. Words and images help you get there. But the desert is that place of silence that is all word. It's the images that brought you to that image who is the Son, image of the Father, that kind of incomprehensible image <laughs> that the Son is of the Father. So words, images get us there. The articles of faith get us there. The words of scripture get us there. Uh, and then you're, you're left in that stillness going deeper than your thoughts can take you. In the desert of the soul. In the ground of the soul. Yeah. So that's, um, okay, so that's the first sign. Is that uh, the Lord is in fact in choosing contemplative graces into your soul. And John the Cross, building on John Tyler, notes that, okay, that sign in itself is not enough. And I just one more thing, just the reason these three signs are important is because these three signs, when they're there, you want to enter more into that receptive disposition, that stillness of soul. And if you do that too soon, before the Lord is pouring out graces of a contemplative prayer in your soul, if you do that too prematurely, uh, you're, you're left in emptiness. It is more like the Buddhist void. right? And that, that is one of the dangers of centering prayer. Um, I, mean, I know people who have used centering prayer in helpful ways, um, but 
it, it can be unhelpful and that you more enter into that natural stillness um, by saying you know, the same phrase over and over again. Um, and so, um, no, you don't want to do it prematurely or you are just kind of left with yourself and like a, a stillness that's more like self-focused or something, okay? Um, so that's why these three signs are important because you don't want to enter into that deep stillness too soon. But on the other hand, you do want to cooperate with grace. And you do, when the Lord is pouring contemplative graces into your soul, you do want to hit that disposition of this complete openness and docility and stillness before the Lord. The Rhineland mystics say the best, the best way we can serve the word is by giving him silence <laughs> to speak into our hearts, uh, to, to fill our hearts with himself. And we move from the words of scripture to the presence of the word himself, second person of the Trinity. This is where the language of the Rhineland mystics, the birth of the word and the soul comes in. They're describing infused contemplation. The words of scripture Leading, leading us to that place where the Father utters the word, the second person of the Trinity and the communion of the Holy Spirit, an anointed word, he utters into our souls, and it brings birth to something new in our souls. The birth of the word in the soul, infused contemplation. If you want more on that, uh, the first conference on John Tyler opens that up some. If you want more on that, um, I gave a conference, Midday Retreat with the Mystics on Meister Eckhart uh, for, for more on that. You know, just quick, you know, footnote, Meister Eckhart, there are problems with him. Um, um, and he should be read more as a poet sometimes than a, 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 a metaphysician. Um, but some of his lines are helpful. Like, for instance, he said, you know, about the indwelling trinity. He says that souls who are not turned to interior things are like those who have wine in the cellar but have never tasted it. <laughs> Through the indwelling trinity, you know, Elizabeth of the Trinity, closer to our own time, is the one who has really kind of helped bring this to the fore in a way. And that's why Dominicans love Elizabeth of the Trinity in a special way. Uh, because we love the, the theology of the indwelling of the Trinity, right? Uh, there's a story about Elizabeth of the Trinity. She's, you know, a, a late teenager, in her 18 or 19, and she approaches a Dominican priest, Father Pierre Vallée. And uh, Elizabeth, she was told as a young girl around Holy Communion time that her name Elizabeth means house of God. And so she was captivated by that, the idea that her soul is the house of God. And so, you know, a little later, she's 18 or 19, she approaches this Dominican, Father Valet. She wants to make sure she's on the right path with this idea that the Trinity dwells in her soul through grace as in a temple. And uh, she says, uh, the poor man, this Dominican priest, went on for two hours <laughs> talking about the theology of the involving Trinity, uh, the implications of it. It's just, I was just looking for a confirmation that I was on the right path. <laughs> but he, he kept rambling on with the theology of the Indwelling Trinity. And you know, we can easily imagine how that would take place, right, with Dominicans. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth of the Trinity, heaven and faith. We all, you know, what's the essence of heaven? It's union with God. You know, through grace, through baptism, we already enjoy union with God. Not, per, you know, it's, it can be lost in this life, but the essence of heaven we already possess. So Elizabeth loves to talk about heaven and faith. We do have that inner wine cellar within us. If we're not turned to interior things, we are like those who have wine in the cellar but have never tasted it. And dryness and prayer forces us to go deeper to that more subtle still point, it forces us to go deeper to find that wine cellar. Right? It was just human nature, right? We don't dig wells unless we have to. <laughs> right? If you know you're settling someplace, you know there's fresh water, like you're not gonna dig a well. <laughs> you're just gonna draw from that that source of water. 
But if there's no source of water around, you're gonna you're gonna dig a well because you're forced to. So it's not just a matter of like, okay, I have to find that deeper place in my soul, so I'm gonna do that. Mission accomplished. Okay, I've done it. Uh, nope. <laughs> it's more of the daily finding that place, responding to the draw of the Lord, responding to grace, and then going deeper and deeper, digging your well deeper and deeper. You know, it's a process of years. It's a process of decades. It's a process that never ends in this life. And when we are in that desert place of prayer, when we are in that desert, to recognize that there is water in the desert. There is water in the desert. Right? But you just have to dig your well deep enough. And when we dig our well deep enough, through the aridity, the water that comes forth is all the more pure, all the more refreshing, all the more full of God. Right? And this is just John 7. Not just John 7, but this is, <laughs> this is the, uh, the life that Jesus says is going to flow forth in our souls. John 3, I'm sorry, John 7, 337, and so forth. Um, he who believes in me, come to me, all you who thirst, Jesus says. He who believes in me. Living waters will flow forth from the depths of his soul. Right? And those living waters are of the Spirit, are refreshing. And Teresa of Avila, as she opens up the life of interior prayer and infused contemplation, um, she opens up John 3.37 to 38. She, she quotes it and says this is what she's talking about. Right? Oftentimes... We just have this impression that, okay, the scriptures that give us like baseline Christianity. And if you really want to go deeper into prayer, well, then you read the saints and mystics as like beyond the scriptures. But no, that, that's wrong. That's not how the mystics saw things. John of the Cross, he sees himself as doing nothing but opening up the scriptures. The Ryland mystics, they see themselves as doing nothing but opening up the scripture. Catherine of Siena, as she talks about graces and prayer, she loves to turn to John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This deeper manifestation of the Lord beyond words, this birth of the word and the soul uh, that human words take us to but surpass, this birth of the word and the soul, uh, this manifestation of the Lord, you know, just, you know, like sometimes in mass, you're just felt, you just enter into like the holiness of God. You just have a sense of his majesty that you don't always have, right? That's the Lord manifesting himself. That's the fulfillment of Jesus's promise. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. You're reading the scriptures and something like hits your heart, enlightens your mind and strikes your heart. That's a fulfillment of Jesus' promise. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. So Catherine of Siena, I think it's Dialogue 61, she comments on John 14, 21 and talks about ways that the Lord does manifest himself to us in contemplative prayer. He can do it by striking the mind with an insight, an anointed insight. He can do it by stirring up the will and charity. And that's fulfilling Jesus' promise. And I will manifest myself to them. She's just opening up the scriptures. And we're just opening up what Jesus says. The living waters will flow forth from their hearts. You know, we have to dig our well deep to find that. And when we do that, then our prayer becomes richer, becomes deeper. Our, our prayer also becomes more stable. Right? If our prayer is overly dependent upon the emotions, like, of course, our prayer is going to be like this. Because our emotions cannot be but this. <laughs> uh, of course, you know, when you're praying in the chapel, you're going to get agitated if you're praying more on the level of, of the senses and the emotions because you do get worn out. There's a, a physical component, right, to the emotions. Um, but the, the more that we go deep, the more we find that still point, uh, the more that even in desolation, even in aridity in prayer, we can find that sweet spot of prayer. We can find that, that deeper place of the fountain of water flowing forth.
that's one of the advantages of having long times of prayer. You know, obviously regular prayer is important, but also to, to note that along with this regular prayer, you need times where you're praying longer. You know, okay, holy hour each day, but I mean longer than that sometimes as well. Days of recollection. Days, you know, where you shut yourself in the Adoration Chapel for the, the whole morning or something. Or uh, once a month. Or you know, your annual retreat. Because in that time where, uh, along the time of prayer, like, you know, the more superficial levels of your being are going to, like, get tired. <laughs> and going to, like, give way. And then you're forced to live more by faith. You're forced to live more by hope. You're forced to live more by charity. And then the then you'll, you'll you'll learn how to pray in that that deeper place. And then once you find that place, that desert place, that interior garden, that wine cellar, then it's easier to dip down into there at moments throughout your life. You know, it helps continual prayer. Uh, to dip down into that inner wine cellar, a quick, you know, Jesus, I love you. You know, you're walking from one meeting to the next. You have like a 30 second walk. Dip down into your soul, adore the Lord, love him. Elizabeth of the Trinity has much on this as she's riding to her, her blood sister, who's a mother, you know, caught up in daily duties. It's a spirituality for all of us. Moynihan, there's a Dominican, has a, a book on the presence of God. It's something like Moynihan, but I might just be translating <laughs> the names. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a classic treatment of it okay, and, other, and others as well. Um, okay, so the set, so the first sign, dryness and prayer, the first sign that God is giving you a uh, deeper prayer and this, this more infused prayer, dryness and prayer, you're going deeper, you have to go deeper. So then the John Cross notes that, okay, well, dryness and prayer could come from other reasons. Maybe your heart's somewhere else, right? Maybe it's, maybe you're, you're agitated in prayer and things aren't going well in prayer because actually your heart, you would rather be like, drinking with your drinking buddies or something. <laughs> you, you'd rather be surfing the web or you'd rather be watching TV or um, you're overly attached to what's happening in your career. And so you're agitated about um, things happening in day-to-day -day life and your career or whatever. And so that's why you're finding prayer difficult. Not because you're receiving deeper graces, but because your, your heart's not with the Lord completely. And you know, obviously our heart being with the Lord isn't just like, a, we can't do it by willpower alone. We need willpower. We need to pour forth the effort. We need to make heroic sacrifice. But you know, we need the help of grace too for our hearts to really belong to the Lord. Um, and so the second sign is, okay, you're, you're not only experiencing dryness in prayer, uh, but your heart's not somewhere else. You're experiencing like dryness in the other things as well. You know, life has become kind of dry. <laughs> as well. You are kind of losing. I mean, you're, you're still dedicated, you're faithful to your career, to your vocation, uh, but it doesn't contain that the same oomph like it did like in your first years. <laughs> you know, like, you know, uh, becoming a lawyer, like it was more exciting early on. <laughs> and that's like everything was like based. And now, you know, you get older, you're a little more mature, you're more focused on eternal things. And yeah, so the earthly like thrill of it's going to like dry up a bit, right? And that's good until you still remain faithful to the call. But yeah, it's more order towards, towards God. So the second sign is your heart's not somewhere else. You're not agitated in the chapel because you'd rather be doing something else or because your heart's somewhere else. So you need that second sign um, to help show that, yeah, the first sign is really from the Lord and not because of your own unfaithfulness and prayer to the Lord. So then the third sign, and John Cross says this is the most important. Then the third sign is that you are drawn to simply abide in the presence of the Lord. There's a draw in your soul to just simply sit in his presence, gazing upon him, looking at him who looks at you from the tabernacle, looking at, at him who gazes into the center of your soul with love. That silent exchange of gazes. You're drawn to sit in that place of simple faith, acknowledging the presence of God. That simple place of hope, entrusting everything to Him. 
that simple place of charity, an esteeming love, a revering love, and our giving ourselves to him for his glory, for his goodness, because he is who he is, and not just because of what he does for us. So when you're drawn into that stillness or silence, John the Cross calls it a general loving knowledge. So you, you, you spent your time on particular aspects of the scriptures, particular aspects of this mystery of Christ, and then you're drawn into a more global taking it in, a simple loving gaze upon Christ being skirted at the pillar, a simple loving gaze of Christ being crucified a simple loving gaze upon the Lord. And you're drawn to that, go with it. Enter into that place of stillness. Receive from the Lord. And over time, what begins as a subtle inflow of, of God in his life will become more and more. Will, will flood your soul. Will draw more and more of you into him, into, into his life. So to conclude this, and that, you know, next conference, we'll actually, uh, we'll see how Catherine of Siena talks about this. Yeah, we'll be able to print out the awesome that, you know, God's providence. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just conclude then with Psalm 46. Right? You know, all these things about deeper prayer and God pouring light into our souls. Like the psalmist talks about it all over the place. In your light, we see light. You know, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. God speaks that word to us through Psalm 46 into that place in the chapel where he wants us to be still and simply acknowledge that he's God. Right? I mean, the Holy Spirit is clever enough, who's the primary author of the scriptures, he's clever enough <laughs> to have these words of scriptures apply on many levels. You know, maybe, yeah, it probably applies to Israel and being at peace and its kingdom against all the warring nations. It applies on that level. It applies uh, to the soul, the tower of our soul, the invincible fortress of recollection, finding that still point there where the Lord dwells, where that living water bubbles up, uh, that river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her as the morning dawns. Right, that invincible fortress of recollection, the indwelling trinity, finding that wine cellar within, being in that fortress where God dwells, right? And Mary is here with us. She's she's that that temple brought to its full perfection. And we hide in her heart to find that still point as well. You want to find that still point where it's not about you, where it's all about God. You want to find that that resting place where you can let your concerns go for a moment or two, for a couple hours as you entrust it to Mary. I pray from Mary's heart, more from your own heart. And she brings us then to that fortress of recollection, and God can let those streams bubble up that make glad the city of God. We can become more and more selfless, and our life of contemplation can be more and more for the glory of others, and then that will flow forth all the more effectively and fruitfully in our preaching. So I'll just conclude with uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we shall not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters rage and foam, though the mountains be shaken at, at their base. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. There is a river whose streams glad in the city of God the holy habitation where the Most High dwells. God is within. She will not be moved. God will help her at the dawning of the day. Nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.